Hi, my name is Jill Hall Smith. I'm the Government Affairs Director with Dayton Realtors. We're here to have a legislative update from Naraj Antani, who's a state representative to Ohio, representing a portion of Dayton. Uh, he's serving his third term in the Ohio House of Representatives. He represents the 42nd District, which covers most of Southern Montgomery. Having been elected at age 23, he's now 27, I believe. 29, actually, we gotta 29. update that. Sorry. He's one of the youngest currently serving members in the House. Antani serves as the Vice Chairman of the Committee on Insurance and is a member of the Committee on Health, on Public Utilities, Committee on Public Utilities and Joint Medicaid Oversight Committee. Welcome to Dayton Realtors Government Affairs Committee. We're so happy that you'll uh, be spending time with us to talk about your time as state representative today. Thanks for having me. Our first question is from Susie Rosalius. Well, what I'd like to ask you is what you feel that the realtor community could do um, to make our communities better. Can you think of anything that we could help out with? Sure. Well, you know, right now? I think that, you know, just by being in business and helping people get homes and, and, and employing people, uh, you do that, right? But, you know, on a policy perspective, I think that, you know, obviously, you know, our local realtors, you know, gratefully are uh, more involved than, than many other industries. And, you know, I know there are a, a you know, a couple, you know, great ideas, including, uh, you know, I think, you know, I'm just completely fascinated by, you know, AJ's idea of, of creating some sort of, you know, 529 college saving programs mm -hmm. for a, a starter home. You know, I think that, you know, that would certainly help people, uh, you know, buy their first home. And I think, you know, different ideas like that, uh, you know, are, are great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Our next question is with Nancy Farkas. I was wondering if you could give us your thoughts on what you are most proud of having accomplished during your past couple of years. Um, and uh, you can certainly give us more than one because I'm sure, sure. you have one that you're proud of. Well, you know, I think there are a variety of things that, that I'm proud about. Probably the, the largest one um, is I had a bill signed into law by uh, Governor Kasich, actually, who um, you know signed the bill in, into law actually in January of, of 19, right before he left office. Uh, and uh, the bill uh, put uh, public record law into place for police body cameras. Now, obviously, that has, you know, once again, sort of come in, into the forefront uh, of the news. Um, but, you know, the bill basically says that body camera videos, uh, you know, are a public record, uh, that, you know, the public has access to them, except, you know, in cases of sort of, you know, privacy. But, you know, all police uses of force are a public record. Uh, and the best part is that, you know, we brought people together, you know, to pass this bill, right? We brought together, you know, the Fraternal Order Police and the NAACP. We brought together the ACLU and uh, the prosecutors, right? And so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I have a record of bringing people together. Now, it, it took me three years to bring them together, but, uh, you know, we did, you know, we were able to, to get it done. Anything else that you're proud of? Oh, I mean, you know, uh, a lot, uh, you know, recently, uh, you know, we got uh, the pink tax repealed, which is uh, a sales tax on, on feminine hygiene products. And then, you know, a variety of different, uh, you know, budget amendments. Um, you know, one, one that was cool uh, in this past budget was that, um, you know, right now, basically foreign students aren't able to play sports um, in, in high school. And, and, you know, look, this, this amendment that we got done, you know, it's not going to change anyone's life. It's not going to, you know, fix a social ill or problem. But uh, it's it's very cool because, you know, these kids who are, are foreign students, you know, come over and they make friends and they want to play sports with their friends and, and their American, you know, the American students who make friends with them want them to play too, right? Uh, and so I was sent a, a pretty cool clip uh, from a Cincinnati student who – you know, hit a three pointer and the crowd went wild. And it was, you know, the first foreign student that was able to play. And, and it was just really cool because a lot of different, you know, I know parents and, and, you know, I, it was brought to me by, you know, the Miami Valley school here in, in Dayton. And, and they had, you know, these foreign students who would make friends and they'd want to play basketball uh, and they just simply weren't able to. Right. And so, um, 
you know, uh, it was just it was kind of just a cool thing to to be able to do for for these kids and and their parents. Our next question is from Dale Barry. Dale Barry's on the City Council of Washington Township and our a member of the Government Affairs Committee. Township trustee. We don't have city councils and townships. <laughs> Those dang city councilmen. That's all right. Um, you you already talked a little bit about education and you mentioned schools. During the corona pandemic, what are your thoughts about the school openings and closures this fall? And how do you think this is eventually going to affect the families here in the Miami Valley? Yeah. 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 Thanks, Dale. And, you know, as I've said, you know, I am for reopening. I'm for reopening safely. You know, I think that there are precautions we can take. You know, we recently, you know, authorized $200 million for schools to spend on, you know, different things to, to reopen safely. But, you know, I think that, you know, we have to think about the long-term health of uh, our society, of our economy, and also of these kids, right? You know, we want these you know, kids to be able to continue to, to learn. Now, obviously, if a, a student is immunocompromised or their parent isn't comfortable, we should be able to, you know, they should be able to opt them out and, and create an IEP, et cetera. But I think this, you know, patchwork of policies that, you know, every school district is going to decide for themselves, uh, I think that's a terrible idea. I think that it's going to lead to uh, a pretty bad economy in, in decades to come. And, you know, a lot of students who, you know, perhaps we're on the right track uh, are now going to be on the wrong track because of this patchwork of policy. So, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned, right? You know, you have the American Association of Pediatrics, uh, who are a bunch of physicians who understand, you know, the veracity and, and you know, the importance of, of health care and, and staying healthy. You know, even they are saying that, you know, students should go back to school uh, in person. And so, you know, I support their position. I think that we can do it safely. I think that, you know, if someone is in a, a high risk category that, you know, they can sort of opt out and, and create an individualized plan, you know, just as right now that happens, if, you know, a student has a, a trauma or something like that happens, you know, we can do that. But, but I certainly think that, you know, we need, you know, students to, to be in school. Thank you. Thanks so much. Our next question is from Bernadette Guerin. Good afternoon, uh, Naraj, and thank you for Hello. joining us. And I've appreciated your, your explanation and comments up to now. Uh, I want to ask a, a question about building and regrowth. And uh, let's have a little conversation about sustainable and affordable housing. Since uh, the tornado of 2019, if you've got any ideas for growth and redevelopment throughout throughout the area. I know your area may not have been adversely affected by it, but certainly you may have some ideas that you can lend to other areas. Sure. Well, yeah, thanks for, you know, the question. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, many of these, you know, different housing developments and, and different issues like that are, are local issues, uh, you know, at, you know, township and, and, and city levels. Uh, and oftentimes they have very burdensome, you know, regulations that prevent new housing developments, that prevent, you know, new growth. And, and I think that, you know, certainly, you know, those need to be addressed at the local level. I think that we can look into, you know, whether at the state level we can preempt them. I know that, you know, we've talked about, you know, preemption with, you know, point of sale inspections and some other stuff. You know, obviously in the Ohio Constitution, we say that cities are, you know, home rule. So, you know, sorry, Dale, we can tell townships what to do, but, you know, cities have, you know, a little bit more freedom, I think, unfortunately, but, you know, certainly I, I think that, you know, we should explore, you know, how to do that, because if we're going to sort of, you know, expand our economy and, and expand, you know, our, our, our society here in Ohio, uh, I think new housing, both at, you know, the affordable level uh, and at, you know, the high end level, you know, matter. I will go ahead and take a question from Barbara Waddell. You're very familiar with the first time buyers, um, home buyers bill. Um, and we thank you for your support on that. But could you give us uh, what, what is your opinion why that bill is still held up? That is a good question. I believe it is still in the Senate. You know, unfortunately, the way the legislature works is we do a lot of things last minute. So let me give you an example. In the last General Assembly from 2017 to 2018, we passed 50 bills between 2017 and October of 2018, we passed another 150 bills in November of 2018 and December of 2018. So 
you know, we wait till the last minute on a lot of things. I don't, I don't like it. Uh, unfortunately, that's how things work. So I think that, you know, there's still certainly an opportunity to do that. Um, you know, obviously the first six months of the term, we are, you know, sort of absorbed with the budget. And then, you know, it's sort of the, the regular session, as I call it. And then, you know, in lame duck with the bulk. So I think that, you know, there's still obviously an opportunity, uh, but it just seems to be the way that it works that, you know, 75% of the work we do finalizes, you know, in the lame duck period. So I think, you know, obviously don't give up hope and, you know, we can, I think, you know, really make it happen in the last, in the last, you know, home stretch. Is there anything personally that you could input on that? Yeah. I mean, I mean, any, you know, calls or, Anything I can do, you know, I would be, you know, happy to, to help and, um, you know, support it in, in any way. Because it would actually add to home ownership. Um, yeah, I, I, of it. I, you know, as I told, uh, uh, you know, AJ and, and, and some of the folks at the state realtors is that, you know, sometimes you see a bill and you wish you had thought of that idea because then you could have sponsored it. And, and this was, you know, as a millennial, right, you know, that's why I was you know, kicking myself that I didn't come up with the idea because, you know, really it should be me, I think, who's sponsoring it as the, you know, millennial legislator, you know, helping millennials buy homes. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I really, really love the idea. The next question is from Ralph Mantica. Ralph is the treasurer elect for next year at Ohio Realtors. So you'll probably be working with Congratulations. Him. So you won, Ralph? I did. Thank you. That's awesome. Appreciate it. Raj, you just mentioned the budget and in light of uh, COVID-19, Ohio had a really nice rainy day fund that is now pretty much depleted. Where do you see and how do you see Ohio recovering from this financially? And, yeah. Uh, I mean, what steps need to be taken? Right. So it actually hasn't been used. The governor has refused to use it, which uh, I think is unfortunate. Um, I am urging him uh, to use it. Uh, and so, you know, he, he cut... $775 million from the budget uh, in the last two months uh, before the new fiscal year on July 1st, even though we've got $2.7 billion in the rainy day fund. So I believe we should use the rainy day fund. And I also believe if you look at the numbers, you know, last month's uh, tax numbers came in uh, above estimates. So, you know, obviously they, they, they downgraded the estimates because of, you know, the economic crisis, but uh, they, you know, they came in uh, above those estimates. So I really believe if you look at, you know, sort of the way the two last, you know, monthly jobs reports have gone, if you look at, you know, weekly unemployment claims, both at new claims and continuing claims that, you know, we're actually going to see, you know, a lot better, uh, you know, a lot better uh, economy in the coming months than, than, you know, otherwise I think people thought of. So I do believe we're going to need to use that $2 billion, $2.7 billion to stabilize, you know, this fiscal year. Uh, but I think, you know, coming into the next fiscal year, I think we'll be in a better shape. Now, are we going to be able to afford some of the, you know, extravagances that we perhaps have, right? You know, if we're going to, are we going to have to cut some programs? Sure. But I really don't think it's going to be a dire strike. Now, I will say that, you know, frankly, not to be partisan, but the Democrats are going to try to get rid of the business income deduction, right? They're going to try to get rid of, you know, they're going to try to raise the income tax. They're going to try to raise every tax. Uh, because they're going to want to spend, you know, money on all of these, you know, different programs. And, you know, I think for the good of our economy, you know, the worst thing we can do uh, is, raise tax, is raise taxes. And the best thing we can do is hold the line on taxes and make sure none are raised. And so, you know, my singular priority, I think, and I've talked to, you know, others about this, my singular priority uh, is going to be to ensure that uh, we, you know, uh, don't raise taxes. Ralph, you had a follow-up question? Yeah, nobody else has one. I, Rod, you've been doing this now for five years. Five and a half. Five and a half. Are there any do-overs that you would like, if you had the ability to go backwards, is there anything you'd do, back, do different? That's funny. Um, I don't think it's a do-over. I think that you learn how to get things done uh, every, you know, every term, right? So you know, every budget you get a little better, right? So my first budget, I got, you know, four budget amendments in. My next budget, I got 10. This last budget, you know, I think I got 15 or 20. Uh, and then now it's kind of like, all right, you know, you, you've been in a while. 
And it's, it's, you want to get more done, but you also want to get bigger things done, right? Things that are, are, are more impactful, right? And you also learn that, you know, doing good things uh, is important, but preventing bad things from happening is just as important, right? So, you know, the business income deduction, for example, in the last budget, you know, that wasn't singularly achieved by me, but, you know, yes, it took a chorus of legislators, you know, raising their voices to ensure that, you know, we were able to restore, you know, that tax cut. Yes, Jennifer, go ahead. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for all that you do to support our interests and our profession and our livelihood for that. We greatly appreciate you. And, um, but I wanted to say thank you so much um, for going to bat for the foreign exchange students because as you know, my son Jake is at Miami Valley. Yeah. And that was a pretty oh, yeah. incredible game. And yeah. the foreign exchange students from China, we, we have uh, students that come from Nanjing and Beijing on an annual basis. Um, and they were so dedicated, they came to practices. Right knowing that they would never get to play. And if they went in, it was probably for 30 seconds at a time. And right. the kid that made that three pointer, he almost cried. So yeah. that was pretty yeah, amazing. I mean, you know, when I, when I heard, and you know, when I heard that, you know, there were kids going to practice, but they couldn't play. I mean, that's pretty heartbreaking. Yeah. Right. And it's brutal. <laughs> we fought, we fought the high school athletic association and, you know, his name's, I think his name's Jerry Snodgrass you know, pretty hard on this. And it's really like, come on, these are high school kids, let the kids play, right? And that sort of became my motto is just, you know, let the kids play. And, and these are the quality of life things that, you know, I think matter, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that really make all the difference. So thank you so much for that and everything else that you do. I That was something that really meant a lot to my son and his team. That's awesome. So, thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time with us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, we wish you luck with your upcoming endeavors and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.